Now, another one is the idea of polygenic inheritance or quantitative characters, all right? which leads to uh, polymorphisms and multifactorial traits. Now, let me talk about all of this. Now, the idea here is that some traits actually depend on multiple genes. So, for example, eye color is actually dependent on a variety of genes. So, when you make eye color, you're actually putting a bunch of genes together. And some of those genes actually have multiple alleles. We talked about that on the other chapters. So, there are a lot of variation that you can create because of that, which means instead of having a discrete look, or in other words, you either look at, or a discontinuous look, where you like either look purple or white, you're going to have a continuous variation or something that's called polymorphism, where you're going to have not just two looks, but many looks with everything in between one and the other, as you can see here in continuous variation. Or, as you can see here in eye color, skin color, hair color, so or human height. And in fact... The majority of the human traits are distributed in what is called a continuous variation spectrum because almost, uh, I would ballpark figure that over 70% of human traits are polygenic, which means multiple genes are involved in the, in the process of creating those traits. In the beginning of the genetic series, I made a bunch of little traits that, just for fun. Those are the only ones I can think of, which are clear-cut, discrete, discontinuous um, variation in humans. A lot of the human genes actually have multiple traits causing polymorphism. Now, you also have the idea of quantitative characters. The idea is that because there's those this many genes, you're going to have a black... Uh, the, the effect of each gene is additive. So the idea, that's why it's called quantitative character. Because maybe gene A tells you to make a little bit of melanin. Gene B tells you to make a little bit more. And gene C may tell you to make a little bit more. And then... Then you end up making a lot of melanin and you look black. But what if gene A uh, tells you to do a lot and then you have gene B with the version or the LU that also tells you to do a lot, but in your gene C version tells you to do very little. You're not going to be as black. Maybe you're going to fall somewhere in between. Somewhere in between. What if you have a gene that tells you to be not be black at all? Then that's when you're going to end up being very, very white. So you see that the additive effect of multiple genes is what actually creates this polymorphism. Um, now, the, there's also the idea of multifactorial traits, or traits which actually depend not only on several genes, but on many different factors, such as what happened to those genes, when was those genes developing, and how do those genes respond to environmental changes. For example, something like your body mass index, or how fit you are, actually depends on multiple genes that determine your metabolism, your, your, your taste for food, and a lot of other things like that. But it also depends on your diet, whether or not you smoke, whether or not you're exposed to certain things like alcohol, whether or not you do physical activity. And so there are also environmental factors which play into this gene, which leads to the idea that there's a lot of traits which can be changed because of environmental changes. For example, Plants respond to changes in sunlight, as we talked about in the photosynthesis chapter, to change the coloration or the expression of certain genes, which causes the change in the proteins and therefore the change in the pigmentation of their things. Also, you can get tanned, but control where you get tanned, and you can create a pattern like this in your back because you, that's showing you how exposure changes can actually change the phenotype of your thing. What about something like IQ? Is your intelligence innate, something you're born with, or is it something that you developed with time? Are you born like someone like Einstein, or did Einstein also become that smart? What about this rabbit here, the Himalayan rabbit? This is very interesting. The reason why his ears are darker and his, and his extremities are all darker is because those areas are colder. If you actually cool down the back of the, of the rabbit, uh, let's say you put a, you cut all the hair up and then you put an ice pack over the growing hair, you're going to force the creation of another dark patch in the back of his back. So you see how the, they are actually uh, black rabbits, but the core temperature of the rabbit prevents them from being black. In other words, the, the, hot of, of the hotness of the body prevents the gene from being expressed and then they look white. But the areas that don't have the heat, 
actually don't have that problem, so they are their real color, which is black. So it's interesting. Now, what I'm trying to say here, then, is that your phenotype depends on a combination of genes and the environment. Genes can activate the environment, and genes can also create, and the environment can also create new genes through process of evolution, and then those genes can, in turn, change the environment. Uh, all right? So that's how these relationships are, are work. And the study of these relationships is called epigenetics, which is studying whether or not environmental or genetic factors are responsible for being the way you are. And we studied this with twin studies. Now, there's two types of twins. Twins which are born for two, from two different eggs fertilized by two different sperms are called fraternal twins or dizygotic twins. Now, if these twins are typically genetic, you can see here, they do not have the same genetic code. So that means that differences between them are going to be because of their differences in their genes. Now, if you, sh if you make sure that they share the same environment, that they're treated exactly the same, everything that's different between them is going to be because of, it's going to be because of their genes. However, of course, most people don't have that. No parents treat two kids the same, so the environment is still going to play a factor into the differences that you see between them. All right? Now, remember that uh, dizygotic twins share half their genes like any or normal brothers and sisters would. Now, identical twins actually developed from the splitting of the egg. It's one fertilization event, which means they have exactly the same DNA as you see here. They have the same exact DNA. Now, what that means is that they share 100% of their genes. Now, if they share environments, theoretically, they would be exactly the same person. But that doesn't happen because everybody experiences the environment differently. So if you were to analyze two identical twins which were raised separately in separate environments, everything that's different between them is theoretically because of the environment, because they otherwise they share their genes. And it's really hard to actually have 100% that you a shared environment because even in the womb, the genes actually, uh, uh, they actually have different experiences because they're, they're growing in different pieces, places of the uterus. So you can never truly have a shared environment monozygotic twin or a twin that comes from only one zygote. Now, another thing that's interesting about this is that two members of the same species can react different to different stimuli. You see how this shell here, uh, th they they all received the same stimuli, but they all acted differently, which created a different pattern across the shells. So you see how there's genetic variation and genetic variation leading to differential responses to the environment. The same way that the different kinds of dog can also respond differently to the environment. So that means different breeds, different species, and even members of the same species all react different to the same environment because they have different genes. And we call that the normal reaction or the tendency to, for something to react to the environment in one way or the other. And you see here how traits are actually studied and how much uh, uh, dizygotic trains or monozygotic trains share. And you see there's a lot of traits that, are, that have a really big genetic component like this, the reading disability is a really genetic. You see how usually dizygotic twins really share that. But there seems to be some sort of environmental component too because there's a really high spike among uh, monozygotic twins as well. So, but this trait, which is autism, seems to be completely environmental because there's barely any difference between the two, the, between the identical twins, but a large difference between the fraternal twins and so forth. And you can look at the rest to see examples of how traits are either environmental or things. So twin studies can help you figure that out. All right? So that's genetic relationships.